I'll let you in on a secret from Silicon Valley. Unicorns live in trees. I learned this from my daughter about six months ago. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon. We were playing in the park in Palo Alto. We are building nests for unicorns out of twigs. And as my daughter regaled me with stories of the complexities and intricacies of unicorn society, I did that thing, I did that sneaky thing, you know, where you get your phone out, and you, you, you hold it down next to your thigh, and you subtly check it just to see if there's anything important happening in the world, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson has updated his Instagram, which he had. I got somewhat absorbed in that. And then I noticed something. Silence. I looked up, and there she was. <laughs> silently, patiently watching me, judging me. I was busted. And then she slowly, carefully twisted the knife by saying, Daddy, when is it my turn for you to look at me? Oh, oh. <laughs> and once I pulled myself by together, I reflected in that moment on the fact that this amazing device that most of us have on us most of the time, this thing that connects us to the important people in our lives, to all the news that is happening in the world and to most of the world's knowledge, this incredible uh, like piece of technological advancement had forced me to look at it. It had insinuated itself between me and my child. It had made me a worse person. But I knew it was going to do it again. Now, as someone whose profession is to design new experiences using new technology, this gave me some pause. Like, how had it come to this? If you look at the newspapers, you, you can see there's abundant reasons for us to start to get pessimistic about technology and our relationship with it. And the stakes are only getting higher. There are more new technologies coming at us faster with higher consequence than ever before. Genome science, AI, nanotechnology, the list goes on. They're happening at a speed and at a scale that is going to make what happened with the internet look trivial. It's not going to stop. It's going to profoundly affect every single one of our lives, whether we like it or not. And we're feeling this lack of control. We're feeling this manipulation. We're feeling somehow diminished by it. It's only natural that we want to apportion some blame. So what's the blame? Is it technology itself? I don't think so. In fact, every new technology that humans have ever engaged with has always been a double-edged sword. Ever since the first caveman picked up the first rock and decided whether to crack open the coconut for dinner or crack open his next-door neighbor's skull and eat their dinner, technology could go either way. It's more a function of the path that we put it on than it is the technology itself. Okay, so does that mean that the moment that we are in is caused by bad people with bad intentions? I don't think that's the case either. I live and work in Silicon Valley amongst the people that populate the companies that are giving us these experiences. And in general, they're really good people. They're smart, and they're creative, they're idealistic. They want to invent new things that make people's lives better. This, this is not what they had in mind either. You just got to look at some of the mission statements of some of the big tech companies in Silicon Valley to see audaciously stated good intentions. And honestly, I think that's uh, part of the problem here. It's eagerness to scale. It's that, it's that audacity of intention. It means that people want to have as much impact as possible as fast as they can. And the tendency is to just put their heads down and start sprinting. But they can be sprinting in slightly the wrong direction. And then all of the 
thousands of micro decisions that accumulate between intention and reality can cause it to veer off further. But the good news is that something can be done, and it's not that hard. I know from my own experience, working in design with new technology, that there are basic things that we can do to help technology to be good. I'm going to share the three most important ones with you uh, with some real life examples. First thing that we can do to help technology to be good is to start with people. Entrepreneurs often have an idea and then are on a mission to make it happen as expeditiously as possible. Seems reasonable, but I've learned that it's always worthwhile to take a moment and find out what matters to people, the people that you're innovating for. What's important to them? What's meaningful to them? What's going on in their lives? Now, this sounds really obvious, but you'd be surprised at how infrequently it happens. What you see here might be familiar to some of you. It's a breast pump. It's a device that allows mothers to maintain a supply of uh, their milk when they're not directly breastfeeding. It's a great idea. But as you can see from the image, it's a pretty complicated contraption. One of our teams recently worked with a company called Willow to invent a new breast pump. Now, you might think, uh, when inventing one of these things, the an important thing would be how fast it works. If you make it a powerful pump, you're able to draw the milk out faster and you're therefore able to afford the mother more time to get on with all the other important things that she has to do. But when we spent some time getting interested in what was actually going on with mothers, we realized that the important thing was not speed, but shame. Shame's a powerful emotion when it comes to breastfeeding. Mothers feel ashamed if they don't breastfeed, and then they can be made to feel ashamed if they do in public. And that turned into a design principle around dignity, or the refusal to feel shame. How might we make every decision in creating a new breast pump with dignity at the core? Why should women feel ashamed of a superpower? That in turn, led to this, which is a compact, battery-powered, wearable breast pump that women can discreetly insert into their bra, uh, and they can pump and achieve their breastfeeding goals without having to put their life on pause. It wasn't the easiest solution to get to. It's not the fastest pump. It's not the cheapest. But we're hearing that mothers love it. The second thing we can do to help technology to be good is to be wrong early. A lot of innovators have a vision about what they want to achieve, and they're driven and motivated by that vision, but the thing about visions is they don't have any nasty surprises in them, and reality always does. Another one of our teams um, was designing one of the first virtual reality headsets. The idea was to contemporize the old uh, Viewmaster, 3D slide viewer that those of us of a certain age remember fondly for Mattel. And we're going to use a parent's smartphone to create a stereo display that a kid could then use to experience VR. We built a prototype to allow us to experience that early, to allow us to see if there was any unforeseen complications that we might want to get ahead of. So this prototype was this compact, lightweight holder for the screen with a nice, comfortable strap around the head. We put it on a little boy. He saw the virtual world for the first time. He's like, this is awesome. And then he just started running, bam, straight into the first wall. This was a good thing to learn early. <laughs> we removed the head strap. We made the design. Um, that, was, that was the first prototype. We removed the head strap. We made the design a little bigger and bulkier so the little kids got bored holding it up after about 30 seconds. We designed digital content that could be enjoyed in 30 second bites. And then it became a viable product. Also gave the parents more opportunity to grab their phone back. 
The third thing that you can do to help technology to be good is to get out of your own bubble. Like-minded people get excited about the same ideas. And they all start working on them together. That's great, but it can lead to blind spots. So I've learned that it's really important to seek diverse perspective and critique as you're developing your idea. This is Barbara. She's our company's oldest employee. She might actually be Silicon Valley's oldest employee. She's 94. Uh, she's holding a prototype that she built. And for years, Barbara has been working with our useful and exuberant design teams to give them feedback on things they might not have realized. Time and time again, Barbara has helped our people see past their blind spots and, and improve the quality of their designs. So there are three simple things we can do to help technology to be good. Simple, but profound. I believe that if we start with people, build prototypes, and seek perspective, then we can move forward with technology in a way that allows us to put our fingers on the scale and cause the pros to outweigh the cons. And if enough creative, idealistic people share that belief, then I think we've got every reason to be optimistic about our relationship with technology and look beyond this uncomfortable moment that we're in right now. So next time I'm with my daughter and there are unicorns around, I'm gonna keep the phone in my pocket and I'm gonna imagine the amazing things that we can create together to improve people's lives and make the world a better place. And who knows, Maybe someday we'll be able to bring those unicorns to life. Thank you. <laughs>